Well, this will be a first for Evan and I as a show, and it's got to be a decade since I last talked to Mike, and Evan Roberts has never spoken to Mike Piazza, and there's good reason Mike doesn't like you. <laughs> and we're going to find out why right now, but joining us is uh, Hall of Famer Mike Piazza. Mike, it's Craig and Evan on the fan here in New York City. How you been, buddy? I'm good. Good to speak with you guys. You and, too. Uh, no, it's not that I don't like him. It's just that... Uh, I remember the softball game and uh, the All-Star game in 2013. We actually played very well. I hit a pretty good ground ball to him at short. Um, that. That, that wasn't me. That was me, actually. I was watching, though. At the time of that. Ah, that was me. I was watching that. Yes, I did play shortstop in the uh, the celebrity softball game for the All-Star game. But, um, but I, I, sh- I wish I remembered that. I, you know what's funny? I, I do, because when you played in that softball game at City Field, I remember yeah. sitting in my season tickets, visioning, wow, I'm getting to see Mike Piazza at City Field. Yeah. Like, this is finally happening, because it was right before the All-Star game. And now I'm thinking about August 28th, August 27th, when you're going to get to do it again. You're going to be in the lineup. You're going to play in the old-timers game, right, Mike? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out if I need to catch or not because I'm trying to figure out who's going to catch, if anybody could actually get down. And if I, can, I went down the other day just to see if I could get down there. But, um, yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a lot of fun. And, of course, uh, it hasn't been done in a while. I, I, know. I don't know when the last one was done, but they've always been sort of great for the fans and a lot of fun. So, going to be a lot of soreness there i think the ice tubs are going to be packed after the game but you know what it's going to be all in good can, fun and and we're looking forward can to it. you because i still think you can can you get one out of city field can you go opposite field uh, off a lobbing doc Gooden, like in the top of the first inning or something definitely not opposite field I, it's funny um you know i've been coaching a little bit in italy uh internationally and we'll be doing the classic next year for italy and so we, we just had a recent tournament in Holland, uh, and the guys were warming up, and so the VP pitcher, and I got in there and I hit because I'm like, well, let me get in here and see what I got. I mean, I haven't literally swung in VP for like seven years. Uh-huh. And um, I was hitting the ball hard, but I couldn't elevate anything. It was the weirdest thing. I was talking to Al Leiter the other day, and Al Leiter's like, you know, I want you to take me deep. I'm going to throw wherever you want. I'm like, <laughs> I go, dude, I don't even know if I could elevate a ball. It was the weirdest thing. And, and – even though I felt like those muscles coming back and, you know, I was taking a few pitches and it was starting to get like a little bit of that, okay, I could see the ball and I feel it. But it's like kind of hitting the gas with an old car and the tank is empty. You know, it's just like <laughs> there's nothing there. So I will do a little work. I will try to elevate one and for the fans, but I'm going to set the bar, bar very, very low. So I hope there's not a lot of difference. I, look, there. the most important thing is Jimi Hendrix is blaring from the PA system like the old yeah. days. You get to the batter's <laughs> box, you do that slow drop of the bat on the plate and get into your batting stance. And as long as you do that, I think we're all going to be fine. And by the way, the way lighter pitches these days, it's like underhand softball anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I know. There's going to be a lot of underhand. So I don't know if it's good or bad, but, you know, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm, I am mean, our fans are really into it. I know it's going to be a, a really great day. So, it's weird. So, yeah. for you guys, I think the best part, again, listen, it'll be nice to be in front of a crowd and, you know, all that stuff and putting a uniform on again. Although half the guys, not you, won't be able to fit in the uniform. <laughs> to be like stuffed sausages in there. But I would think you'd agree that the best part for you and guys that played in your era is going to be the time you spend in the locker room just BSing with the guys, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. We will probably won't even get out to the field. I mean, because we're just going to be, you know, having so much fun and, and talking stories. And, and as you mentioned, that's the one thing you really miss. You miss the camaraderie with the guys. You miss being on a team. You miss just trying to, to achieve something together and, and time's on the road. And so, yeah, that, that's going to be the best part, uh, as you said, just just – pre-game during the BP and having fun and making fun of each other uh, because, you know, people today may be a little bit more sensitive in this day and age, but we used to say, when we used to make fun of you, that's because we like you, you know? Listen, so, uh, the Met fan base knows that with you firsthand. Hey, Piazza's here. Let's boom right away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I was funny. You were, when you were talking about the voodoo child, Henry's playing on the thing, I could like, hit into a double play after John Oliver drew like a nine-pitch walk <laughs> and get booed off the field. And I feel like I'm just starting out again. Yeah, so it'll be, unfortunately, what, uh, you know, still memories nonetheless. What what pissed me off, because you, you bring this up, and this this still annoys me to this day, is they make the trade for you in 98. I'm freaking out as a kid. Like, I can't believe Mike Piazza's a Met. And you were hitting 330, 340. 
And any time you made out, my fellow Met fans were booing you. And they like to forget this. They like to act like it didn't happen. And it was the first time I ever got into a fight at a game because I started screaming at people saying, what the hell's wrong with you? you guys at the 3.30 for us, and you're booing him. Did that annoy you? And were you thinking to yourself, I can't wait to get the hell out of here? Because you were a free agent at the end of the year. You could have easily said, I'm done. I was here for a few months. These jackasses are booing me when I'm hitting 3.30. Did that thought go through your mind? Well, at first, there's no question we're all sensitive at times. And as a player, I've always tried to put up a front where you have to you have to put up a shell, armor, whatever you want to call it, to protect yourself. Because I knew coming here, I mean, I knew what the pressure was. And I, I could feel it, no question about it. And as you mentioned, I wasn't swinging the bat too, too poorly. But I really wasn't driving in big runs. You know, later I would get a hit and maybe knock a guy in early and then – you know, late in the game, I, I, I remember one game against the Devil Rays, believe it or not, I grounded to a double play. And I think after that, that's when people started getting a little bit, their patience was wearing thin. So I wasn't really getting that big game-winning hit. And then it just turned around. Uh, I also think it was a good thing for me because I looked at it as a personal challenge, even though it's something you don't like to go through. It's just, of course, your ego and, and you do get sensitive, but Look, I've said many times before, I said in my Hall of Fame speech, it, it was the best thing that happened to me. It, it reset me. Maybe it made me a little angry. Maybe it gave me a little bit of chip on my shoulder. But it prepared me for what it was like to, to play in New York. I mean, one day you're a great game. You have a good game. The next day you, you have a bad game, and, and you get booed. And, I, and that's just something, unfortunately, and fortunately, that's just part of, the, part of playing here. That's what it's about. When you got traded, because I think for a lot of people in my generation, I remember where we were when we found out that Mike Piazza's coming to the Mets. I ran home from playing basketball to call my dad. I was that excited. But for you, I wonder, you had gotten traded to the Marlins a week earlier. Were you upset? Like, the legend is Keith Hernandez cried in the shower when he was traded to the Mets. Did you have a reaction similar to that? What was your reaction? Well, to put it, to con- to, to put it in context a little bit, too, um, it was a little different than Keith, only because, of course, I had a, a bad contract falling out with the Dodgers, and they had just been sold to Fox, and the, their corporate people sort of took over the team at the end of spring training in 98, and we started negotiating. And we just, we just, it was ugly. It just turned ugly. I mean, I went public, which was kind of like a little bit of a mistake because people are like you're crying and you're going to make all this money and the, the usual tagline. So um, coming here, I had a little bit more of a chip. Um, it was a surprise only because, you know, I, I, I was shocked that it was the Mets. Uh, but then again, uh, they had an up and coming team. I mean, they they had made some trades in spring training to the Marlins as well. I think they got Allen Cookie, yep. and then of course um, a few uh, weeks later, then I came and the Dodgers. I think traded traded uh, Charles four guys for me: Johnson, I think Eisenreich, um, uh, Bobby Bo, and and uh, of course Gary Sheffield. So it was it, the circumstances were very strange because of of the whole contract situation. So it was a little bit different, and the Dodgers just basically didn't want to. Uh, they felt like we weren't going to ever come to a deal, so they traded me. So I was. It made me very angry, and it, it did give me a little bit of that chip. Talking to Mike Piazza. Mike's going to be appearing at the Sheen Center uh, tomorrow, July twenty sixth at twelve thirty. Uh, you can go to SheenCenter dot org to learn more about it. But it's a traditional performing arts venue connected to the Archdiocese of New York. And uh, the Sheen Center hosts, uh, it's kind of like a TED Talk type of thing a lot of times. They also do film screenings, theatrical productions, and concerts. And uh, for this particular run-through, the Sheen's Faith, the Competitive Edge series, which is inspired by the Vatican Sports in the Service of Humanity movement, is what Mike will be talking about uh, with Leslie Maxey. If you don't know who Leslie is... Leslie is a 1988 U.S. Olympian track and fielder and broadcaster. And uh, Leslie will be interviewing Mike for this. We'll get into that more in a moment. Mike, listen, you made gobs and gobs of money. You're financially secure. But I do wonder at any point when you see the contracts that are out here today, and this is a generational thing, you know, Johnny Bench would have said the same about your contract and on and on. Have you ever contemplated what you think a Mike Piazza contract would look like today? Wow. Uh, it's, it, it is kind of staggering in a way. And I got to be honest with you. I am so happy for these guys. I mean, in a way, as long as, as long as they understand, um, 
the significance and they and they treat it with respect and they try to honor their contract with integrity and play hard keep themselves in shape hustle because you're going to have slumps you know slumps are part of the game and you're going to struggle but um jim leland who i played for said look it doesn't how much money you make if you go into a slump they still you just still still need to hustle and it makes a difference and that's what i always tried to do but to say what i'd be worth today oh it's impossible i mean I have no idea. I mean, I do believe a lot of the guys today are so much better athletes per se. I mean, they're in better shape. They have better training methods and things like that. But, you know, it's tough to say. I I don't know. I mean, maybe with the new school today, there would be a lot of teams that wouldn't want me to catch as much. Um, So maybe I wouldn't have been as catching as much. They'd try to move me to first base a little earlier because of all these new sort of philosophies and whatnot. So so it's impossible to ponder, really. Hey, did – did Jim Leland ever sing to you? Just, no. <laughs> he was great, though. I mean, the one thing I loved about him, though, is I've never seen anybody smoke in the shower before. <laughs> I was, I was, he comes in after game, and he's lathering up, and he's got a nail in his mouth, and I'm just, he just takes, you know, just like nothing, he, no big deal. I'm like, God, <laughs> He literally terrible. managed you for a week, though. If man, it was only with the Marlins, right? That was the only time Jimmy Leland managed you. So he yeah, had, we've always had a mutual respect for each other, and even after that time, he... He gave me one a really nice talk when I first got there. He just said, look, I know it's going to be a tough time for you. When I got to the Marlins, yeah. because they were obviously dismantling the team right. and they were in a complete rebuilding. And he said, dude, he goes, Mike, he goes, you're, you're going to get your money. You've earned it. You deserve it. Don't let anybody tell you you don't deserve it. Just play hard and, and think you're going to end up right. Just try to be positive. And he was just an amazing guy because he was a throwback guy. He was an old school guy, but he also believed in, like everything we're talking about with faith and, and teammates and trust and um, everyone hanging out and getting to know each other. And so I think maybe my little chip today is that the guys just don't know each other as well because, you know, you got phones and commitments and things and, and life has changed. It's a little more complicated, but I remember the times just hanging out with the guys and having a few beers and talking about the game. So that was one thing Jim always impressed upon people. I- I know that I need to get over this, but I still haven't been able to, and it's been 21 years. Has Roger Clemens ever explained what the hell was going through his mind when he took a shard bat and threw it at you in Game 2 of the World Series? Not not really. I mean, I saw him at Michael Jordan's golf tournament, I guess, about... mm, It's been 20 years ago, my God. I guess in the mid-2000s. And you know what? I guess life has a way of milling you out. I mean, I, I have no resentment. I still have no, I have no bitter feelings. If I see him, I go, Hey Roger, what's up? It's not any big deal. I mean, maybe in his mind, he's never really felt like he wanted to talk. I, I look, I'm a man. If you would say, Hey Mike, I want to talk to you. I'll talk that, you know, I would say, fine, let's talk. It's no big deal. But, um, again, you can't, if you spend too much time in life, wondering what it's going through people's minds, you kind of waste a lot of time. So I've always found that to be the case. So, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, he obviously, at least from as far as I know, he's never really addressed it publicly. I know he has either. To... I know, and it. it yeah, yeah, but, hold on. but I think part of that is, a like Evan said, it's been twenty years. Fine, but I I think there's a lot of guys that don't have the balls or the backbone to ask him about it. He may have the same answer you have, like, I got nothing against Mike. I'd love to talk to Mike, well, but, but, but no one ever asked Mike, Mike, do you believe the BS that him and Joe Torre gave after the game that he thought it was the ball? I still argue with Yankee fans about this, and I'm like, well, this, he didn't think it was the ball. Did you think that? Honestly, I think, well, putting that issue aside just for a second, yeah. the only thing that, for me, that I didn't really like was the whole thing about um, that they were, again, remember they were switching the rotation so he wouldn't play yeah. at Shea Stadium yeah, they were and he wouldn't hit. Yeah. Whereas I think finally it was the funniest thing because then it got to a point to where myself personally, I was like, ah, you know what? I don't even give a crap anymore. It's like, let's just keep, you know, it's, it is what it is. It's, it's sort of like the moments pass, but if he would have done it right away, we would have hit him, you know, in the back and it would have been over. And right. that's, that would have been the rules of the day and it would have been a big deal. But then when it got, when it dragged on and it just made it this whole sort of Roman gladiator, you know, Coliseum mentality, it was just like taken away from the game, in my opinion. So that's what I got a little bit bummed about. And then finally, of course, Sean threw behind him. (laughs) And it was a bizarre day because he took him deep and then I took Roger deep again. So everyone at the end of the day was trying to figure out what really happened here. Like, who? 
who is the winner, the, so it even made it even a little bit more. quickly say, Evan, we're talking to Mike Piazza as part of his appearance with uh, the Sheen Center. I know Evan's got a bunch more for you, but let me just ask you, since you're on the phone and they were kind enough to set you up with us, give us an idea of uh, what you're doing for Sheen Center and why you're doing it. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's af- after Fulton J. Sheen, which basically talks about the intersection of of faith and sports. And um, just for me personally, the way I grew up um, and how faith was important in my development, and it was just mainly from my mother, and it's kept me stable, it's kept me confident, it's given me peace in my life, and um, I think at this point, obviously, it's countercultural because you don't hear a lot about it anymore because of just changes in society. But generally, um, it's just part of my history. It's just part of who I am. And it's, you know, growing up was something that was so was very important to me. And it just transitioned in my adult life, too. So talking about how it inspires you. And there's a lot of athletes out there that sort of lean on their faith that have uh, helped them, you know, give them hope and give them discipline and um, help them in their careers. So that's pretty much what we're going to touch on. You know, I wonder about that, you know, famously, your dad was a tough guy and, you know, made sure that, you know, his son was in the cage hitting every day before anybody knew who Mike Piazza was. And that's an interesting, you know, part of your childhood and part of your relationship with your dad as you were growing up. And I wonder if you've ever thought forward if you had a kid that you thought may have had the potential to be really, really great at whatever the discipline is, singing, acting, yeah. sports, et cetera, if you would do it the way your dad did it to you, or if there was ever any resentment towards that, which now looking back on it with great clarity, I'm sure you appreciate, you know, the tough love aspect of how, how your dad played such a big role in your development. You want to know something? That's a really amazing thought, and it is true in a way. Um, I think it is tough. I don't know. I mean, I find myself treating my children a lot differently than my dad treated me. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. My, my son is nine, and he just said he wants to play Little League next year baseball, you know. And so I'm like, fine, I'll help you do it. But I've never pressured him to play, right. which is really strange. But, you know, I think it was just one of those things where my dad looked at me, and he just knew I was that kid that could take it and could take that uh, discipline. And, you know, again, I think it would be bordering on a little bit of, a, of abuse today, but he, you know, forced me to get out there every day against my will sometimes right. to practice. It's just not a po- it's It's countercultural today, as I said. But um, as you said, I look back and I'm like, God, it's the best thing he ever did for me because I don't know what I would have done, really. I think there, as much as I was strong and I was disciplined and I worked and I had no fear of work, I still was kind of a little bit of aloof, and I wasn't very focused. So he kind of focused me for myself. <clears throat> and my kids are different today. You know, I, I wasn't really in the school. I wasn't in academics. So, you know, the kids today are. You know, my kids are more than, than I was. So every generation is different. Every, every kid is different. There's not one size fits all. But, but that's a great point. I mean, I, I think about my dad all the time. Recently, he passed last September. Right. And, yeah, I mean, it's because of everything that he's implied to me is because of of where I am, the reason why we're talking today, the reason why I get to do these cool things, you know, at the Sheen and for the Mets and the, you know, with the subway series coming up this week. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting thought, but one that I guess we'll always be, um, you know, we'll always wonder about. Are you a subway series guy, regular season? Do you like it? Are you a fan of it? I mean, I think it's cool. I, I think it's hard to argue. I think maybe going back to my era, I think the games were, were definitely, <laughs> Very cool. I mean, I mean, I think when in '99, it's arguably '98, '99, those games, and even 2000 were were pretty intense. And I think the city kind of really stood still. And uh, yeah, I mean, the game that uh, you know Matt Franco won against oh. Mo Rivera was probably arguably one of the greatest games between you know our two teams. But um, you know, you could argue maybe. It's, it's still very cool. I don't know. Again, I'm not listening every day because I'm not. I don't live in the city as much. But I, I wonder how the fans still feel about it's, it. I, I it's not. Feel- you, you were a part of peak Subway Series. I mean, ninety seven, yeah. ninety seven. You weren't there, but ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand, and then after the World Series, it's cool. But it's not the same. Like you mentioned it, that Saturday afternoon game, Mets Yankees, where you hit a home run that still hasn't landed. I mean, I think Howie Rose jokes it's the first home run in the history of City Field because it was so far off Mendoza. And then Franco's game winning hit. Like that was 
That was a World Series game. At least it felt that way. The energy was incredible. So I don't know if it's ever kind of matched what it was in the late 90s, the peak Subway Series. I I agree. I mean, I think the energy is different. I still think it's pretty cool. But, I mean, remember, both teams approach it with a little sort of, it's important, but it's not that important. You know what I mean? We always try to downplay it because we don't want it to be the defining moment for the season. And, of course, with the postseason changing, it seems like both teams are going to be in the postseason, which is obviously more important. Right. So, yeah, I mean, uh, but back then, yeah, it was it was different. There wasn't as much sort of social media. So everyone was just kind of locked in on the game, watching the game, every moment of the game. There wasn't so much of this highlight uh, mentality. So it was – we could feel it. And we definitely didn't want to be embarrassed. See, that was another thing. Sure. Um, you know, it was about pride as well. So, so once those games, yeah, if you off, guys got blown out by the Yankees and you went out to dinner in Brooklyn that night, that'd be a tough spot for you. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, we'd just go home and hide under. <laughs> oh, <a bed>. yeah. <laughs> well, as fans, we felt the same Third way. It, taking the the home run after nine eleven aside, because that was obviously bigger than baseball. Was there a home run you hit? Because I got one in mind as a fan, but I'm curious for you. One home run you hit as a Met that was maybe more special than any other home run you hit that kind of sticks out for you. Well, for me, one of the only home runs that I remember distinctly was the the ten run inning uh, inning against the the Fourth of July night after Fonzie tied the game right. with a two run single, because I remember walking up there and going, "Oh shit!" Oh, excuse me. No, yeah, it's all, it's all good. It's all good. I said, uh, "You know, if I can get a hit here, I go. This place is going to go crazy." And a Terry Mulholland, who you know, I had gotten pretty good swings off of. I'm like thinking. I could get here, and I knew he was going to come with that cutter, so I just kind of pulled my hands in and got the barrel on the ball, and it was one of those Carlton Fist type of things, you know. Yep. I, that was one of those nights to where I think it was kind of magical. I mean, home runs, any game-winning home run or, or put your head home run late in the game is a special, like Pete had one the other night, uh, last night, I should say. So those are really cool. Um but that one was pretty cool because of the fireworks night. Everybody was hanging out. Everyone yes. was like, can we get this game over? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <Fireworks>. <laughs> that was you know? the joke because if, no, if there's no hung out, if there's no fireworks, cool. people leave early. That was always my comment about that game. Like people would have given up and said, ah, we lost. And this I got game. two follow-ups for you. <laughs> Off the bat, did you think the the uh, fly ball against Mariano was gone? Well, I got to bring that up. I got to ask, like, because oh. normally oh. a hitter has a feeling off the bat. Oh. Like off the bat, did you think it was gone? No, no, I you didn't. Knew. I Got was, it. I was, I was hoping it would sneak into the gap and keep the game mm. going. Uh, yeah, I mean, I hit it good. I mean, anytime you get a swing like that off Mo, it's, it's actually, I hate to say it, a little bit of a positive thing out of a negative thing because I mean, I, it was a good swing, it was a good pitch, and uh, it just didn't quite have that lift and that oomph. You know what I mean? Right. And Mo was so good because he threw that easy cheese. You know, the ball just exploded right. out of his hand. And uh, so it was just tough to get good swings off him. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a good swing. I mean, as I tell people, it's like it's frustrating to make the last out of the World Series. You know, it kind of sucks, actually. But Well, there's a lot of people um, thought that ball was going to go about 50 feet further, too. Uh, you know? Yeah, the only sort of redeeming sort of, uh, you know, Joy, I guess, was watching Joe almost have a heart attack. Because you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you could just see the way he looked at it. It was like he was like literally almost had a heart attack. And then he's like, oh, yeah. my God. You know what I mean? So and to then, put a little bit of, of ice on him a little bit was kind of cool. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, that was one of those World Series that still is frustrating. Because, you know, we think about Timo got thrown out, you know, with that great play from Jeter and the, on the relay. and. Um, you know, we had momentum going into that series. And let's face it, Ar- oh, let's face it, Armando Benitez. I mean, the guy was a great regular season closer, uh, but yeah. if he puts Paul O'Neill away and doesn't right. give in and walk him, I think You're we right. win. Yes, I'll say we. I'm a Met. We win game <laughs> one. And I look, I don't know if we win the series because that's a dynasty. I have great respect for what the Yankees accomplished, but it's a different series. I mean, it's very You're different. Right. No, I feel that too. That's the thing that haunts us because I think if we could have won that first game, then it would have changed the energy a little bit. Obviously, would have put more pressure on Roger the second game. You know, with the, with the that was the bat game, right? So it it would have it would have been interesting. You know, I mean, yeah, we could ponder it, but uh, hey, what are you going to do? Foiled again, man. You, you know, the one home run that jumps out of me is actually in a loss. Is the home run you hit against John Smoltz when he was uh, having to throw sidearm in Game Six against Atlanta? Yeah, and what's still I, I I shouldn't say pisses me off. I'm still confused about it. Maybe you have an answer to this. Is that 
Bobby took you out of the game three innings later. He brought in Todd Pratt for defense or something like that. Did that ever piss you off that it's game six, you guys had rallied back, and Bobby, for some reason, is taking you out of the game in the extra innings against the Braves? Well, to put it, but also, you know, to put it in context as well, you know, I remember I had the really bad thumb issue uh, in the Diamondback series. And that's when Todd, um, was that, that was 99, right? Yeah. When, that was 99. Todd, that was the same year. Yeah, the game winner against Manti in the Diamondbacks. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yep. he, was, he was playing pretty well. So at that point, Bobby was kind of like, you know, and I was, kinda, I was really banged up too. Okay. So he was like, you know what, there's no loss with Pratty being in there. He's playing really well and back up. I mean, he started the game one at, uh, behind the plate. I think I DH'd that game as well, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in 2000. So, yeah, I mean, Todd, look, Todd was a great backup, and, and I think at that point I was really banged up. So there was, there was some, some physical issues oh. there as well. I you was know, kind of probably out of gas. When you first retired, I, said, I was saying at the time I did the show with Boomer, I'm like, you know what? Piazza's like a once-a-year kind of guy, big event kind of guy. You'll close a building, open a building. Uh, but it seems like you're back more frequently, which makes me wonder – is there something in the works where you're going to start doing something more actively, whether it be for the Mets or MLB or just here in New York? Is there anything cooking other than, you know, a couple appearances here and there that we're going to start seeing more of Mike Piazza? Well, I hope so. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm at a point in my life to where I enjoy these things. And, uh, yeah, I don't want to be that guy who just shows up you know, all the time. And then you get people then get a little bit like, Oh, here he is again. You know? So uh, I, I may have said that a couple weeks ago. I'm like, Mike again. Like, I mean, strawberry's not available. What are we doing? <laughs> but, uh, no, listen, I enjoy what I do. You know, we do some really great stuff with the Mets heritage, you know, Mets heritage.com. Check that out. Yep. Um, I love working with the alumni. Um, it's it's fun for me, you know. Steve is really active, and and the, now the historical stuff, kind of reconnecting with the past. So he's doing that cool stuff. He's got a benefit tonight. I mean, you know, it's it's fun for me. I, I enjoy it. I mean, I love coming up and seeing the fans. Obviously, I got the vodka club there. You know, Piazza Thirty One Club, but True Vodka at City Field. Check that out. So, yeah, I mean, look, I life come is in good. As, as long exactly as long as you know, I enjoy. They enjoy having me. It's it's a were, lot of fun. Were you were you in Cooperstown yesterday? No, I just got back from Europe actually gotcha. with my kids, I, and uh, you know I went to go see my mom uh, with my kids. So she they haven't seen her since God, you know, my father passed away. So we right. just spent a few family time. But next year I'm I'm thinking well, of going. Actually, I, I was going to say something because earlier you said I don't know who won the battle between you and Roger Clemens. Well, you get to go to Cooperstown without buying a ticket, and unfortunately <laughs> he does. So ultimately, who won? Hmm. Well, he had a pretty good career, say. buddy. I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. They both had great careers. I'm just <laughs> saying. One that, guy's in Cooperstown, all. the other one's got to buy a ticket. That's all. all right, so, I assume you're going to be at City Field tomorrow and Wednesday, though, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'll be there tomorrow. Yeah, I'm definitely excited to come out. Um, yeah, we have the, the thing early, so then we could head out. And then, yeah, I'm probably... I think Wednesday I may be shooting out there as well, yeah. Nice. So. Let me ask you, so let me, if, let's say you knew somebody, like a dear friend of yours. Let's just call him John Doe for the sake of the conversation, okay? And uh, Mets, Yankees, tomorrow, let's say this dear friend of yours had a luxury suite, and he sent you a text message, but he signed it his full name, and it made you wonder, well, this kind of appears to be a form like he sent it out to a lot of people because I've known this guy for 20 years. He's one of my best friends why would he sign a John Doe? Wouldn't you start thinking for a moment that the invitation to tomorrow night's game is not really all that special, and he probably sent it to a lot of people? Is that what happened? So you got like a form invitation? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, Governor Christie. Chris Christie invited me and my son to a suite for tomorrow night. We've been friends for two decades. But in the text message to me, he pointed out that the Mets are in first, he pointed out that the Yankees are in first, and he signed it, Chris Christie. So I accused him of sending me a form text message and not an authentic one. And I just wondered what your take would be on that. Man, you know, I don't know the minutia of your friendship, so who knows? Is it Could he be pulling a, having a little fun with you, or do you think hmm. it's like just... 
an oversight or? I <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Um, offline, <laughs> I'll tell you what the sweet number is. If you want to come by and ask him tomorrow, I can set that up. Yeah, I saw him last time. No, give me the sweet number. I'll come by. I have a drink with you guys. No problem. Great. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i put you on hold before we let you get out of here, and I'll give you the sweet number off air. Uh, and then no we problem. can have the conversation in person, okay? All right. Everybody, check Mike out, sheencenter.org. He'll be with uh, Leslie Maxey talking about kind of the intersection of faith, humanity, sports, et cetera, all the things that, you know, especially the younger generation of athletes coming up need to know a lot about. And I have to tell you, Mike, really enjoyed it. Appreciate the time. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And anytime you're in New York, uh, definitely look us up and say hi, okay? Yeah, appreciate it, guys. God bless, man. Take care. 